Welcome to the new year and to Accidental Gods podcast, the place where we still do believe that another world is possible and that together we can make it happen, particularly if we all have a singular vision and we all put everything that we have towards it. I'm Amanda Scott, your host at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution and increasingly in the service of finding a way through to that more beautiful world that our hearts do know is possible. And my guest for this first episode of the new year is a friend of the podcast. Eva Bishop was with us back in episode 88 in her role as communications director of the Beaver Trust, showing us how beavers are part of a systemic answer to a systemic problem. In that context, she's also co-host of their wonderful Lodgecast. I'll put a link in the show notes. Do check it out. But after we finished recording that, in our conversations as we waited for it to download, we were reflecting on the fact that we all have different identities. Eva's a communications director, she's an activist, she's worked for many NGOs, but primarily she identifies as a mother of two young children of primary school age who really cares about the climate emergency, who wants to communicate that to her children but doesn't want to terrify them. And how do we do that? And it seemed to us that this was a really important conversation and that we should be having it as part of the podcast. And particularly now, in this, our third year, when I want to bring us people who are deeply exploring possible answers. Because all of us, parents or not, need to be able to communicate with the younger generations in ways that will help them prepare for a future that is going to be entirely different to the one that we imagined when we were their age. So people of the podcast, for the second time, please do welcome Eva Bishop, activist, lodgecaster and mother. So Eva Bishop of the Beaver Trust and parent and climate activist, welcome to the new season of Accidental Gods, where we are really going full out now to find answers. I think we've done enough of critiquing the present and why it's not working. We kind of got that. So welcome back. Thank Thank you you so much for taking time out on this slightly dreary morning. (laughs) And before we head into the main topic of parenting in the climate emergency, tell us a little bit about the beavers, because I've been watching your Twitter threads and streams and seeing that beavers in Scotland have been rescued and relocated, which, yay, go beavers. <laughs> Tell us how the beavers are doing around the country. Yeah, they're doing uh, they're doing really well. There's lots of progress being made. Um, we're still fighting hard for for quicker and swifter action. But the example at Argati up in Scotland is really exciting. So, and it's a story of um, perseverance and you know individual belief. So, so the the family at this red kite centre fought hard to get the beavers licensed. Um, for their land and how really trailblazing actually and we managed to yeah take um, a family with three kits over to that site and it's a wild release so they could leave if they wanted to but so far they're sticking around yeah and it's and it's everyone's just so thrilled about it and it's kick-starting hopefully a new movement of more licenses being applied for and they'll always need licensing Um, but hopefully it'll be a bit of a launch pad for more beavers across Scotland and something that we can follow then in England as well. So are the English beavers that came from England transported to Scotland because that's far enough away that they won't try and home back to their home territory or or where did they come from? They came from within Scotland so translocated within range which is which is the first for that sort of thing so quite often either the option is to lethally control them um, if they are uh, if under license or to translocate them but a lot of them have to be translocated to England because there aren't receiver sites in Scotland okay. so that's what we need more of and we need more of them across Britain um, we just we need the licensing process to speed up so we can save more beavers and and help their you know population growth and stabilization brilliant so people listening if you know of any land that might be beaver positive, then do let us know what what is beaver positive land. What are the criteria apart from the <laughs> fact that we own it and we are happy to have beavers? That is the big question. And actually, the first step is to get a feasibility study done. Okay. 
By the Beaver Trust. Yes. Get in touch. We'll come and check it out. But it's worth checking out most places with streams and rivers. You know, it's um, particularly higher up the in, in headwaters in streams where they can do the, bring their most benefit. And the local water company not tipping raw sewage into the river at the place where you want to put the beavers in would presumably also be good. Generally, generally helps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but beavers will come and help if they've done that already. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... Beavers are cool, but we didn't come to talk about beavers today. We came because you listened to the Louis Weinstock podcast and got in touch and said, I really want, as a parent, to talk more deeply about parenting in the climate emergency. And now you've got a really cool mind map that I'm looking at of a potential book. And we thought, because we are looking at solutions and so many people are either parents or relatives of young children, and the world that we create today is the world they grow up in. And it's not going to be the safe world that you and I thought we were growing up in. Mm. So kick off for me, if I were an editor at a publishing house and you were pitching this book, give me your pitch. I've been thinking about this and thinking about it and thinking about it. And I think it's something that I need to really hone. But the basis of my thinking is that there is this giant activism void which is parents. There are billions of us literally on the planet. And we I see the strength of the youth response to the climate emergency. And I see this, I feel the utter confusion that the parents aren't reacting similarly. Mm. We are in the fight of our lives for us and our children. And the people I talk to are not changing. They're not doing enough. They're not and I think, and, I, and I'm trying to work out why, whether, and, and there's lots of science about why, actually, <laughs> you know, the, the response to a major threat, it's not imminent enough, all that kind of stuff. But I'm a bit of a systems thinker, and I see all the little bits of my life, and I just think parents are one of the central hubs that connects much of what we do. And we have a huge weight of responsibility, but also of power to drive change. So there's bits of individual action required because that cumulatively can have a huge impact but also think of the number of parents sitting in parliament think of the number of parents sitting on the boards of major corporations if they cared and knew that their children's future was at risk they have the power to do something about it mm -hmm. so i feel like if we mobilize the power of parents and for me particularly mothers and i'll come on to that later we could have it could be it should be part of how we drive hope through action. And there's all the, this, this other part of it for me personally, but I think for a lot of other people, which is that we we need to give permission for people to be involved and be part of the change. Um, and I feel like this the groups against scientists for climate action and teachers for climate ag action is missing something because I don't fit into a label. So I don't feel empowered to join in any of those conversations, but I've got plenty to give. But the one thing I do have, do fit, is, is that I'm a mum. And again, there are two billion or so parents in the world. Let's involve all of those. That's a big proportion of the population. It should be sufficient to be a human on the planet and have a voice. And people with a stake in it, their children, you know, they, they need to do more. My idea is that I just want to share more ideas and bring together sort of collective community-based action. I had, I had a lots and lots of triggering moments of this idea of wanting to share more. But one of them recently was that I had dinner with a really good friend of mine and we were sitting there and I sort of explained what I'm doing with work because it's, you know, beaver work is for me, climate activism mm. um, and nature activism. And I said, we talked about flying and all, all the various angles. Of it. And she said, she said, Eva, you know so much. What should I do? Should I not go on holiday? Should I do this? Should I do that? She's a really intelligent woman, but she's sitting there knowing climate change is happening, but carrying on with her ordinary life or life as was, certainly not an ordinary life. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I just thought more people need to know this. Part of it is inviting people into the conversation, isn't it? And um, uh, Bella Lack recently said, apathy, greed and selfishness are the biggest threats to the climate emergency right now. And tackling it with ourselves and with our children, you know, we start to improve two generations at once. And you can, you can overthink it, but you can also look at it in every angle of your life. And I think that's what I've started to do because, because I'm living that. Um, that's what I kind of want to communicate to other people. And, you know, the school and education 
piece of it and the the, the mental health and eco anxiety um and the food security issues you, you can break it down to the real basics um and then see what you can do and the, the wonderful thing is there is a lot of joy and fun and you know wholesomeness to be taken from a lot of climate action so so let's unpick some of that because i really resonate with the ap apathy, greed and selfishness being part of the problem. And I was reading Ronan, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, he's Kate Rayworth's husband, and he's written a book called How to Be a Good Ancestor, okay. uh, which is brilliant. And, in, and it, again, is looking down the generations, how can we do this? And, and early on, he says, he quotes somebody else who I can't remember, saying that if Aliens from another planet wanted to come and destroy humanity. They wouldn't send down spaceships with little green men. They'd create something like climate change. <laughs> As you said, doesn't trigger any of our Paleolithic fight and fright, freeze, fill about any of those responses because it's not immediate enough. So we have a government that's getting into conniptions about the European Court of Human Rights and wokery, mm. what a, whatever is that. <laughs> You know, we're losing a dozen species a day in the sixth mass extinction. Mm. And we haven't got the time scale. Again, Ronan had a brilliant metaphor, which I am sharing with everybody now, which is if you imagine the whole of time in the way that a yard used to be measured in ancient England, which was from the tip of the king's nose to the end of his outstretched hand. And that's the whole of time the ho uh, from the beginning of the earth. Yeah. To know. And he said, one swipe of a nail file over the extended finger, middle finger of the king's hand removes all of human history mm. in that time scale. And I, that just blows my mind in terms of, a, gosh, we are such an ephemeral thing. Mm. And yet, we are in the process not only of eradicating ourselves, but everything else. Mm. But listening to some of the people I know who are not in the climate bubble, the shift from denial to despair seems to be going on rather fast at the moment. I've stopped having the alt-right members of the family saying climate change isn't happening. Yeah. And instead they're going, well, there's nothing we can do because China. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which seems to be what the right-wing think tanks are throwing out now. Is well, They've stopped trying to tell us it's not happening. They're just telling us there's no point in us trying to do anything because the Chinese still have coal-fired power stations. And the Chinese actually are moving very fast yeah. and are doing stuff that we're not even thinking about. But also... That, there's that cliff analogy, isn't there? It's not that we're walking to the edge of a cliff and we're going to fall off it. It's a slope and we're already on it. And so any day, any day you start to join in is going to improve the outcome. Yes. And, and any day you can wrestle the wheel away from the guys who are staring at the cliff edge and still have their foot on the gas exactly. is a good thing. So in your book, let's plan your book. Let's assume that the kind of people reading it are the people like your friend. That's exactly it. It's people who, they, they know climate's happening, but they are, and they're not quite despairing yet. They're just simply not engaging with it because it's too big to contemplate. And they haven't been given a roadmap. They have no yeah. vision of where they can go and how to get there. And just don't fly isn't enough. Although that would be good. We have an extended member of the family who, one of her school friends, m married a footballer. You know, money, no object. and recently. The kid, the three-year-old, wanted to eat ice cream by the sea. So they took the private jet from London to Cornwall for the afternoon to have ice cream by the sea and be home in time for the dinner party. Yes. And so now I'm watching Eva putting her hands over her face. How, how can people... I, I just listen to that and think, no, really? Do, do you yeah. so not get it? But mm. they don't. It's not that they're being deliberately evil. It's just not in their awareness. Exactly. And until we can get it to the point where, you know, Coronation Street or whatever, I don't even know what the soaps are these days, but the people on the soaps are discussing this, mm -hmm. then it won't be. So how do we also, we need to reach the people who care but have no idea what to do and in that kind of white out fog of, well, I may as well carry on as I have done because I at least know how to do that. Yeah. And let's assume someone else will sort it all. So here's an, an analogy for you on that in that regard. So as parents... If we don't do anything ourselves, we're basically giving our children to a babysitter who chain smokes, is <laughs> yeah. drug dealing, alcoholic gangster. Is that really yeah. okay yeah. with you, parents? It's not okay with me. Right. We need to take back the power. Yeah. Okay. So how? So that was my. That's where I'm leading to. How do we reach the people who who fly to Cornwall for the ice cream? But also, how do we reach 
your friend mm. who does get that there's an issue but has no idea what to do about it. And I think there are two those are two separate groups of people. And maybe it's yeah. not your job to reach the ice cream in Cornwall. Maybe it's your job just to give a roadmap to the people who do get it. So what would mm. the roadmap look like? How would you structure this book? Would you start off with I'm a mum and here are the reasons why I care to give people a kind of moral and ethical basis for action? I think you have to start with the with the extremity of how bad this is. You have to okay. state it yet again, um, yeah. because I don't think people understand are willing to listen to or, you know, have uh, engaging with how bad this is and how rapid things will go extremely wrong. Then I think, again, another um, aspect of being a parent is that you, how much people care for their children. So with with a few minor exceptions, most people will do anything for their children. Mm. And as Jeremy Lent said on one of your podcasts, change has to come from people returning to the heart. So yeah. it is an untapped resource to sort of say, okay, parents, what would you do? How much is it worth to help your children have a livable planet? And then I think that there's something in bringing people along on individual action as well as forming a community around it. So we, a lot of people are now looking at the fact that local and community is the solution to this because central and systemic government stuff isn't happening quickly enough. Yeah. But for example, two years ago, I, I started a project called My Action Matters and I had a website and I sent out a weekly action to a group of parents Yay. at school. And then we all did it together. And I would do the little intro and a video of why this is important. And then I'd give us the action and I'd give a bit of the science and a bit of the if two billion of us do this, this is the impact of the, of the carbon savings. Well, who? It was really awesome. I, I only didn't keep it going because I couldn't. I wasn't paid to do it and it took too much time. You can't do these things on your own and it may be something I need to kick start again. But there was a lovely example from that where on, on water efficiency week and I gave like three actions that you could do. One of them was not to have a bath every week for your kids, every every night, sorry, of that week. And a friend of mine at school said, this is amazing. Like we saved the carbon, we saved the the water, we saved money, and my kids turns out they didn't like having a bath every night. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that. Okay. And there was there was joy, fun, and time gained from climate action, and it was simply leading people through it. Um, and and again, that was a community built around school. Another right. parent out out. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a potential for, for loads of parents to get involved around the school hub. And that was a roadmap. Essentially, off what I was offering there was a roadmap to change. Yeah, some brilliant. of those things have stayed in place, but a lot of them will have slipped back into old habits. Um, but the more people you build around that, you can talk about it at the school gate. You can talk about it with your friends. The kids can start talking about it, and then you get real change. You know, real excitement yes. around it. Brilliant. You get conversations then, and that seems to me you're right. Localism is the thing. And the more that can ripple out, because if you can ripple out a little bit, then you begin to affect things like people's voting habits, or at least the letters they send to their MP of, we did this, and why are you not supporting this? Yeah. And look, this extra could happen. And, um, you know, I don't know, change the agricultural laws because we want to be able to eat food grown locally. And at the moment, it's all being shipped out to South Africa because Brexit. Why are you not changing it? Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. And there's that three and a half percent thing isn't there about how many people we need uh three and a half percent of the population mm. or something like that i how how true that is i'm not sure but but you only need one person in each community yes. to have the guts to stand up for what they believe in and tell people actually it does matter so sitting at yes. like a parent thing organizing christmas once um someone said oh we can't we can't we must have all the glittery stuff and all the plastic crap they called it <laughs> plastic tat um for the christmas fair because otherwise it's got to be really cheap otherwise this I, unnamed let's call her Sandra um I know Sandra will get really worried about it and get cross about the money and so everyone laughed there's big laughter about the environmental thing and I was like actually it does matter you know and that's with it's such a slow shift that we just need more people to raise their voices about it and I, and again if you have a community who has signed up of parents who are signed up to do to stick up for each other hmm. and do more and challenge each other and talk about it on a weekly or monthly basis, you'll start to get the kind of changes that we need. And yeah. Yeah. And people devising Christmas decorations that aren't yeah. plastic chat. And, and aren't, I, I had occasion to go through the village here last night. We're recording this before Christmas. And I obviously haven't done that after dark at around Christmas. Everywhere mm. is lit up with fancy lights in the trees and on the hedges. 
And um, and my, my all my fears is going, well, why are you doing this? Why? What what are you doing? And there's, oh, well, we have to keep ourselves cheerful because COVID. Uh, surely, is there not another way that doesn't involve burning power? Really? Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing that, again, if you get yeah. enough people engaged enough, they will work out the ways to create Christmas that doesn't involve mm. lots of plastic. I was at a farm walk here and our local farm family are now homeschooling their kids because COVID brought them home and they realised how much happier they were. And they're doing climate science at home. They've just written to Prince William to say, could he organise a ban on party poppers? Because they all have little bits of plastic that then scatter around the countryside. And he's written back to say thank you for your letter and nothing else. Mm. But they did it. This is now a family of kids that gets that and then yeah. can tell all their friends and they'll generate other ways of having fun that doesn't involve scattering microplastics. Don't get me started on party bags. So yeah. <laughs> kids. I don't kids know parties. what a party bag is. So kids parties that I've experienced involve an hour and a half in like a, a, a warehouse with sensory overload, lots of like just full on energy experience for the kids, loads of sweet food um, loads and loads of expensive oh presents and then every child has to go home with a plastic bag full of little bits and pieces of plastic like as a party bag a takeaway and I, I was just thinking when are we going to wake up and realize that that's not necessary um, it's 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 like a horror show oh. and this peer pressure is once somebody does it every, so so there's a new book it's a whole separate book which is the climate friendly children's party book. Yeah. Lots of pictures, lots of things, lots of look, your kids can make this stuff. And there's loads of, there are loads of ideas floating around already. But again, it's it's about no, making a stand okay. and doing it. So so I was I was fortunate yes. that my nine I was my nine year old's birthday at the weekend. She asked for a walk in the woods with her friends, which I was just thrilled oh. about. And Switched um, on, kid. but it's because yeah. I talk about it all the time. So it's I'm yeah, I'm very lucky, right. but at the same time, I, I still have to sort of say we're not doing party bags because we're not, because we don't need them. The, the party yeah. is what the, the time with you is what the children are having. That's what they get. You know, they don't need to take home. And think. And how did the other parents respond to a walk in the woods rather than full on sugar overload in a warehouse with plastic after? They loved it. They loved it. But it took a lot more energy right. and organisation from me than paying somebody to run your kid's party. Okay. Because that's what that's what those the alternative is. It's but you could pay someone to run your kids walk in the woods. You could, you could potentially. We need more people to be offering that. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of the forest schools would would actually be really happy to do that, and they definitely. And I suspect they probably do. Um, I didn't look into it. I just sort of thought a walk is is enough, and it's lovely. So we'll do that. This leads into one of the big things about parenting in a climate emergency is about sacrificing other things because you need more time to do it well right and you need you know food is such an example that going to the supermarket is an absolute minefield you cannot choose right because either it's covered in plastic or it's non-organic or it you know it's or it's not local you can't get it right and so you have to sort of choose what your battle is going to be that day. And, you know, I've, I've chosen organic and I'll buy organic and pay more for it, even if it's the version right. that's covered in plastic. But in order to do that better, you need time to go to your farmer's market. Mm-hmm. And most parents mm-hmm. don't have time because they also have a job. Yeah. They have to look after the kids. They've, they've planned three meals out of seven this week, but right. not the other four. So, you know, oh, God, I'll just get some sausages right. and mash again, you know, which is not, not a vegetarian meal. And it's not, you know, it's, it takes so much time to try and make the shift. And I think that's where, again, we can help each other by sharing examples of what we already do um, and what works. And presumably... Helping with local community supported agriculture so that you can have a food box delivered so you don't have to go to the supermarket. Totally. Yeah. yeah. It seems to me that food is a huge thing in everything that we do. The whole food systems of how it's grown, is it grown regeneratively, is it grown in monocultures, does it have sprays, does it not? Yeah. And then the transport and the packaging and the delivery. And supermarkets I was thinking about this the other day. They didn't, I'm sure, set out to be the hub of all evil. No. They just thought, this is, you know, let's be convenient and have everything in a single place that somebody can go because it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And yes, we will make a bit of profit. And capitalism being what it is, they then turned into megaliths that can crush farming and force feed 
millions of people on food that has no nutritional value. So in your book, because this is the problem with parenting is it's very labor intensive. We don't live in villages anymore where the grandparents or where the whole village raises the child. You're doing it as a one or two person unit with one or more kids. And frankly, I, I think as a not parent, I don't understand how the human race has got this far <laughs> because I, I couldn't do it. Um, but what would you do? How are we going to solve the food system crisis at a family level? That's a fantastic question. My experience and what we are doing is we are trying to grow more of our own food. And I think there's a huge amount you can do to educate yourself and therefore your children and tackle things like, you know, eating too much, um, you know, the, the overconsumption. Overconsumption and waste are two big issues, actually, with our food system that are often overlooked. And we're sort of thinking about where does it come from and what types are we eating. But if you only bought or, or, or grew what you actually need, that cuts out a whole pile already. Something like 30 or 40 percent, actually, I think, is wasted, isn't it? Yeah. And there's an app, isn't there, where you can connect with other people in your area and say, I've got this that I'm about to throw out and I'm not using. Does anybody yeah, want only- I think that works mm. best in cities. Obviously. Yes. Yeah, totally. And conversely, you know, veg growing is harder in cities, potentially. Although there was a lovely article out this morning about the um, benefits of potential oh, in the Guardian. produce of, market, uh, yeah, it, of, of allotments in urban areas, which is fantastic. Yes. And a lovely um, conversation on Farmerama with some people in Glasgow who are running an urban farm. Around the time of COP, they went and talked to people who were doing things that COP should have been talking to, but but weren't. And so I think urban farming, actually, if anybody's listening as a parent, if there's one thing that could make a huge difference, finding a plot of land. This was, they had 26 families getting food boxes from what had been a tennis court. Gosh. And they'd done it all by Charles Dowding, No Dig, you know, just building up raised beds. So you don't need green land, you need space. Yeah. And then you yeah. can grow. Space and again, community. Um, yes. You know, you don't need to be doing it on your own. And yeah. this is where education system ties in because schools can do a lot of this learning and Satish Kumar's, you know, we need to get our hands in the soil more. Yeah. It all links yeah. up. It's all so systemic and about slowing down and having more time for grassroots stuff and actual roots and um uh yeah there's there's just so much and kids love growing things it's a module at school that they'll come home with a sunflower seed and grow it at home you know in primary school and they all get huge joy from it and there's determination and and patience and real understanding of the roots of life in all of that stuff and you can do that at home you can do that even without a garden actually um you know you can grow grow peas in a tub in your kitchen windowsill and eat the pea shoots and 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 it's it all leads to a healthier diet and more exercise outside when you're gardening and all that kind of stuff. So there's, but it requires a cultural shift or a cultural renaissance, really, isn't yeah. it? About a meaning and, and purpose in life. And I think that the climate emergency is going to force that on us if we don't choose to do it first. Anyway, yeah. in terms of food security and and community, and, and we saw that a little bit with COVID. So in lockdowns, people started to grow more. Suddenly you couldn't buy any seeds because the whole world wanted to grow their stuff at home and share the vegetables that they grew. So there was there was natural bartering of stuff uh, in our community. Um, and we can choose to do that. And shift our economic system, that would be good. And Abel Pearson found when we talked to him in COVID over in West Wales with his community farm that he had so many volunteers who came during COVID because they wanted to be doing something outside and productive. And so many of them, when COVID was relaxed, really did not want to go back to the office because they had found what it was to be part of something that felt real. And I think that's a huge lesson also. So what people can do then is identify the land, perhaps just go and talk to a farmer because it's far more cost effective for a farmer to have a dozen people in the village paying him to run allotments on the land than his you know that three acre field being having sheep on it say Mm -hmm. it's it's a much more cost effective way and then you get community around the land and you produce food for the whole village and I think I haven't finished that Guardian article but I think part of it was how much more productive 
small areas of land f- farmed for food by large numbers of people are than yeah. industrial farming. Totally. And as you said, kids love it. It's an amazing thing as a child. I remember just planting carrot seeds and, you know, six months later, you are harvesting carrots. It's like magic and it's wonderful. And it's in, it's like loving fire. And they pull them out of the ground and eat it with the earth on it. Yes. They eat the yes. They don't go yes. and wash and it. Is that. And that's yes. really and good for them. And it's brilliant for your bio. Yeah. And then you light a fire. I do remember <laughs> somebody ran a project in London where they were lighting fires at the foot of multi-storey blocks and inviting people to come and share their food and cook. Mm. And they were getting this huge multiracial, multi-generation thing because, again, fire is it's so deep inside us mm. that wanting to sit around a fire and just put the marshmallow on the stick and hold it in the fire, you know, something doesn't have to be full of sugar, and share. And then, again, if you've got people from lots of different countries, everybody has cooked around a fire mm. at some point somewhere in their ancestry. And it can be a huge bonding experience. It can. So let's have a chapter on cooking around the fire in this book. Yeah, completely. And there's another aspect of growing veg that I've discovered, So, with which is that I have another project that I'd like to do, which is called Companion Planters. So me and two friends go or do, do Thursday gardening on rotation at each other's houses. Okay. And we have a couple of hours of veg action with a cup of coffee and a natter. And it is the absolute highlight of my week. It's a mental health boost. It's a physical health boost. We're growing our own veg and we can share seeds, you know, seedlings and the, the crops. And it's an absolute highlight. And I just think if we get more people doing that kind of thing, growing together, you're sharing space, you're doing all the things we just discussed. But again, it needs time. So what if the government chose to do a four day working week and mandate that you've got an extra day to, to start this transition? People, parents particularly, I think, need to be given time because otherwise you are on the go from sometimes six in the morning mm. <laughs> till, till you know, nine o'clock at night when you've got a big list in your head of all the things that you want to do and you're just absolutely knackered. Mm. So, you know, we need to give people time. And I think that uh, the, the four-day working week has been proposed by several people, I think, and it's, you know, it's such a no-brainer. It was proposed by Corbyn at the last election and, and the, the entire media went berserk. But then, of course, when someone else said it after the election, they're going, oh, yes, that would be a jolly good idea. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, yes, a four-day working week. I think the key with the four-day working week is it's a four-day working week, but you get paid the same. Yeah, oh, yes. And the guy who did this in, I think, New Zealand, there was a, a really quite hardcore neoliberal free marketeer who did it in his company. And he said, if you can do the same work in four days, you can have Fridays off. And guess what? Absolutely, it happened <laughs> because yeah. people would like, you know, four days at work and three days at home is feels a lot better. You don't get that terrible Sunday night blues feeling of, oh God, I have to go back to work no. as much. And I think the key to your companion planting is the companion. You're not doing it on your own because I, Absolutely. when I run the polytunnel, it can be a bit isolating, but doing it with people is crucial, mm. isn't it? Absolutely. It's really crucial really crucial and i think that you know yeah it's it's fun and i want more people to do it i want more people to experience that 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 boost and the joy of it and the intergenerationalness because certainly when i grew up the older generation had all lived through the war and they'd had to feed themselves and so they knew they had these beautiful ways of of doing the canes so that the beans could grow up and you know everybody's allotments were a work of art yeah and again if you can bring that older generation is largely gone now, but still bring generations together. Mm-hmm. Then then I think also you get the children talking to their grandparents about why it matters that they become politically active in favour of climate change and stop worrying about, I don't know, the foreigners arriving or whatever the Daily Mail is telling them. <laughs> because we know politically that if the government was structured by the votes of the people under 40, we'd have had the biggest Labour majority the world has ever seen. And if it was the over 50s, the Tories would never leave. Mm. And at some point, we have to start our politics being geared towards the generations that are coming, not the ones that have been. Mm. And the only way to do that is to get those conversations going. Mm. Completely, completely. And I think that we really mustn't underestimate the fact that there will be 
increasing crop shortage and what whatever we yeah. can grow here is actually genuinely valuable. Yeah, you, know, you can laugh off, laugh off a complete wipeout of your sprouts through some sort of infestation at the moment. Yeah, but, but in June, not far down the line, we won't be able to laugh that off. Yes. That'll just mean no, no broccoli, no whatever it is. Yes, and Jem Bendel says this that we're going to go through longer and longer periods where we either have no rain or too much rain. And in our growing, yeah. so part of our companion planting and and bringing people together, we need somehow to build in the resilience of let's collect water when it's absolutely bucketing so that we can use it for the long periods of drought when it doesn't feel like drought out there at the moment because it's grey and dark and dank but Mm. it's not actually rained for quite a long time our pond that usually is full all winter and empty in the summer it hasn't filled up yet and again as a veg grower you notice that stuff so you're much more in tune with the land and what's going on and with nature and that's can only benefit your overall interaction with the world and your understanding of water scarcity and things like that, that we are we haven't experienced yet, but will do. Yeah. And how building soil turns it into something that will absorb much more water. My, my What I call my sacrifice area with the ponies that I've been building up just for the last two right. years. I, I put out the litter from the stables and they walk over it, coming in and out of the field. And now everywhere else in the land, the water either runs off or stands mm-hmm. and that bit is a sponge. Mm, in two years, it changed the nature of its capacity to absorb water. And that yeah. kind of experiment is, again, something that I think kids would find inspiring. And you can talk about the whole regenerative cycle and, and the soil biome and look at the nutrient density of the food that you grow. Oh, then you get into the gut biome and well, yeah. oh, it's just yes. yeah, amazing. It's such powerful stuff. And I think that another th- big thing I think the education system misses is how alive to information our children are even at a young age you should not underestimate how much they can absorb of this stuff they understand it you know even where we we don't we we almost overthink it to the point where we don't engage with something actually kids get it yeah and we need them a chance to understand it more and develop their own um views on this stuff because then they will use their innate creativity to help us solve some of these challenges. So we're looking really at a radical change to the education system as well so that we stop sending yeah. kids in school and telling them that they need to learn Latin or whatever it is that Michael Gove oh, was God. wanting and and give them the tools then to be more systemic thinkers and to plan their own resilience. Completely, completely. So how would we do that? Um <laughs> I don't know, but it needs to happen. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, no, there's a lot going on already. So there's things like Teach the Future um, and various people offering um, open source climate change curriculum additions. Okay. And there's there are you know there's a big teaching movement um, that you can find or, or across social media and things that are engaging with the uh, Department for Education and trying to get the curriculum changed. But fundamentally, the problem is as ever capitalism and our whole system and the fact that um it was brilliantly put by ken robinson i his 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 ted talk on um education from from quite a while ago absolutely amazing so he he says something along the lines of education is a steady erosion of the natural creativity in children right. and the end goal of which is for every single person if you think about it to become a university lecturer yes yes <laughs> which is, you know yeah. and if you um <laughs> And it's so important that we have individuals in our society. So I've, I've only got as far as primary schools so far in my understanding of the curriculum, because that's where my kids are at. And a lot of schools, and particularly a lot of individual teachers, are trying their hardest to do that. But the end of the day, they have to teach the curriculum because right. that's what the tests are about. And right. that's what that's what the end goal is. So I think it's about changing the end goal, because then what you're teaching inherently has to change and I experienced that in lockdown where the the very first one where everyone was really overexcited about staying at home and finding new creative things and it was in Easter holidays and I had three weeks of absolute heaven and we did nature journaling and we got outside and explored the world and then term time inverted commas kicked in and I had to teach the curriculum and it was hell by comparison (laughs) you know and and it was so that was a real eye-opener for me and it's not that Things like maths and writing a language, which are the basics at primary, aren't important. They're, they're really important and they're applicable across loads of things. But it's the emphasis on which we put that. So, mm. I, you know, I often find myself feeling anxious about 
grades and 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 how my children are benchmarking against their class and then I remember to myself oh yeah but university is not going to be there when they're that old because the world will be in such chaos and so I have to step back and I'm like okay so what's important and that's what I need to lead on yeah and and I think that things like school gardens are helping to transform that and find other creative outlets where kids that aren't naturally academic and wanting to do literature and maths can find other you know, can find their place, whether that's music or veg growing or sport or, you know, and it's, and that's really hard to do given the resources available Hmm. to schools and the time that they have to squeeze this curriculum into again. It's, it's huge, but really important, I think. And once again, it's that handing over to the government babysitter Hmm. You need to take back that power. I think more people, parents need to realise the impact that they can have, the influence they can have to change that, change that thinking. I was the only one in our school who took my daughter to the climate strike in Bristol, where she heard Greta speak. We did a little poster, and it felt like you know it was a big decision. I was like, "Shut! I know one else is doing it." You know, and I'm I'm a climate activist. I'm like quite, "Come on, let's do this." And I felt nervous about taking her out. It's ridiculous, but you know that experience has stuck with her. Right. And it was an opportunity to talk about the importance of all this stuff. And, and you know, it's growing in her as a thing, as a belief and as a, a responsibility, actually. And if it's not going to come from school, it has to come from the home. It has to come from parents. And how is that going down with her peer group? Do they think she's weird or are they envious that she got to go? Are they listening? That's a really interesting question. The first thought that comes to my mind was that she was given a tree by one of her friends for her birthday. Okay, <laughs> so, they're taking notice. At that's, least. that's fairly taking notice. Yeah, I don't think she's treated that there's a freak at all. So hopefully that's you know it's sort of water off a duck's back. But and and presumably the parents actually bought the tree. So not only has the friend noticed, but the friend's parents noticed. This is good. Yeah, yeah. This is this is progress. So you know it is. Yeah, they do notice. They do notice, and she got some really beautiful birthday presents and thoughtful, you know. Um, recycled stuff and a poster of trees that was on ethically sourced paper and all this kind of stuff so they they know yeah and that's really cool they aren't changing though and I think that's again where parents and and I need to do more to connect with those people and create a space where we can talk about this kind of stuff and I think that anyone that understands the gravity of the situation we're in has a duty to talk more about it Yes. Um, and that leads on to the whole chapter of mental health and eco anxiety. And actually, we are facing, you know, we're on the, we are on the cliff edge here of a mental health crisis. We're, we're in it, actually. We're getting to it, aren't we, nationally? A youth mental health crisis or a general mental, both, I suppose? Both. Both have been, you know, scientifically sort of stated recently in the news. And um, there is a going to be a vital role for parents, I think, in emotional resilience and having the safe space for their children to talk about this, particularly as we talk to talk about it in the curriculum more, they're going to come home. I mean, I've heard, I've heard of friends, children's coming home. In fact, a friend of mine who is an administrator at a local school had a parent phone them up really, really angry that they'd been talking about climate change and telling and frightening their child. Right. Right. Well, that seems to me the media thing is, oh, my God, we're terrifying our children. This is bad. Not, oh, my God, climate change is really bad. We need to do something about it. So there's a kind of universal gaslighting that's happening. Yes. Whoever tells the kid about climate change and the children are. Louis has an amazing story in his book that is coming out in April and I will hopefully get him back on of a young person who's brought to him as a psychologist. And they're, I think, 13 years old and they had been top of the class, top of everything, doing really well, th- thoroughly engaged in school, and they just stopped. Mm. And, and eventually were thrown out of school because they didn't do any homework, didn't do anything. And this youngster comes to Louis and as the progress of the therapy says, I've looked into it. We are finished. And everyone at school is behaving as if I've got a future where exactly, as you said, I'm basically heading to being a university lecturer or an investment banker, and there is no point. And I, how can I sit in class and pretend to be interested in Shakespeare yeah. when when the world is falling apart? And Louis started off going, yes, but you know, there's XR and there's hope, and and he end, realized he was gaslighting also. And what mm. he had to do was join this young person in their reality and and sit in the despair of that with them. Yes, and 
how do we change? Because we're we're back to the people who are shifting from denial to despair and, and the whole yes but China concept of they I don't know that they have the emotional resilience or we haven't offered them a future that has enough tangibility and enough accessibility for them to go, okay, yes, there is a problem and what we need to do is this. All we've done is say, fly less, eat differently, don't yeah. drive your big car. Yeah. And we know behaviorally that telling people not to do stuff doesn't work. You have to reinforce the good stuff. You can't keep punishing the bad stuff. It just isn't emotionally and psychologically valid. So how do we get past the gaslighting instinct? <laughs> the instinct, I don't know how we get past that, but I think that there's, there's the whole world of storytelling and creating new power in new hero stories. So rather mm. than the individual hero is coming to save the day, maybe there's a collective heroes thing um, and parents can be that and they can really enjoy doing that together. And, and that sort of feels, you know, that's what we're doing with the companion planters thing. And that's what you could do with a parent climate group at schools. I think there will always be gaslighting and it's about our, it's more about our response to it. And this is about knowledge and empowerment, I think, for parents to say, it is that bad. Your children should be afraid. That is a mm -hmm. very natural response. And here are some of the things that we can do about it right. to help give them hope through action. So right. taking action ourselves and, and again, accepting when they're afraid of it, that's a good thing. That's a really healthy re reaction. Um, and then sort of understanding the basis of emotional resilience to catastrophe and hardship. Um, it actually goes straight back to the sort of neurobiology of child development. And, and I would encourage everyone to, to watch a video by Joe McAndrews um, on climate change and children. It's all over YouTube. And she is from the Climate Psychology Alliance. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, brilliant. She talks about the amygdala response to alarm. and But if you can learn to shut the lid when you flipped your lid and you know it needs a professional to explain that but you then have the capacity to care for others the emotional flexibility to deal with challenges the choice about how you behave yeah. and she talks about that as as because of the effort and determination and, and repetition that that learning this stuff takes she thinks that is right. climate change activism yeah. and i love that concept and in, in, you know if parents start to think okay we need to help our children respond to this in a healthy way not panic and shut down and despair and all that kind of stuff learn how to be useful people in the world for and with yes. our children then then that's an, a, a, a probably the best you can get as a, as a mental health eco-anxiety response um, and she gives three brilliant tools as well I need to, talk um, to this person, don't I? To help your children. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So so grounding and and feeling it in your gut and and gratitude practice and all that lovely stuff. And I do some of this with my children, and it's fascinating to watch. Yeah. And and then that again leads full circle back to our connection with nature and understanding our place. And it's yeah, oh, I don't know. There's just there are so many um, webs of connection when you look at children, climate, food security, you know, all of that stuff, and, and nature. All right. I'd like to move on to nature connection in a minute. But just before we go, it seems to me that what we are discussing is creating an entire generational shift of emotional resilience and emotional intelligence so that we have mm. a whole generation who are capable, exactly as you said, of seeing when they hit that amygdaloid trigger and responding to it. And that that then would also help with another of my big fears, which is we're in the era of social media and limbic hijack. That's what it's for, is to trigger people. Yeah. Because the more triggered you are, the more you'll engage, the more you engage, the more they have your attention, the more they have your attention, the more they can sell you stuff. And mm. we need to be able to spot the trigger, feel it in our own body, feel that physical impact of, of that dopamine twitch and know what to do about it. Mm. And so if we're giving them that skill, we may also be addressing the systemic issue of tribalizing on the internet and mm. and everybody becoming more polarized. And also then the side issue of how do we make sense of a world that is coming to us fed through our screens yeah. when we have no way to assess whether what's coming is real or not. Mm. That the, the fake is as 
looks as real as the real and, and what is truth anyway. So it seems to me that any response to climate has to be a systemic response and therefore it has to take that yeah. on board as well. How are your kids or the kids that you know handling the world of social media? So um, it's an area that frightens me half to death. It's, it's because it's so integrated in our system and it's so um so hard to not control but influence as a parent um and i there's something for me about webs of connection here and finding like-minded folk that you can hold up as examples so i have uh, my kids cousins have a really wonderful healthy outdoors lifestyle and don't watch much telly and um the uh, the eldest one is just starting secondary school where all his friends have a WhatsApp group and they all have phones. He simply doesn't have a phone yet because that, that my sister doesn't want him to have a phone. I'm like, yes, this wow. is amazing. And that's born out to be, they, they were proven right recently when something hideous went round on the WhatsApp group and, and this, my yeah. nephew didn't get to see it. Hooray. Right. Brilliant. Right. But he ex sim sim conversely experienced, you know, the homework being set on your phone and he sort of puts his hands up and says, I don't have a phone. Well, don't do your homework then. What? You know, we've got to... What, the teacher says what? this. The teacher said, don't worry about your homework. So disadvantaging a child, but oh, standing up. <laughs> so I... So I <laughs> no, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So, um, but I... I often have to refer to the strength of the bond between the cousins in our families is really great. So I have, have to often refer to this child and say, well, look at your cousin, you know, he's really happy. He doesn't have a phone. He doesn't have screen times. And it tends to settle the, all oh, my friends have a phone or, you know, why can't we right. have screens? It's something right. I'm constantly battling. And I, I was thinking the other day along the same, similarly to sort of saying earlier, I think we underestimate how, how much young children can understand and take on board. I think it's about empowering your children. So I have every intention of starting and have started to talk to my children about the dangers of social media right? and what the whys and the science behind it and the, the sort of the credible lines so that they have the knowledge to make the choice themselves and trust that they might, might in due course make that choice. Um, because again, that's not just saying, no, you can't have a phone. It's saying why I'm worried about you having a phone. And that's really different coming from your yeah. parent, I think. Yeah. Um, and having the model of the cousin. Yeah. And having a, having a model that they respect and they think, okay, maybe there's an alternative. And I think part of, yeah, and part of the parenting community response to climate needs to be connecting and spending more time with those people that think like you and starting to grow that network and starting to invite other people into it so that you start to have an influence in your you know locally so i have a question on that i was listening as i always do to tristan harris's your undivided attention podcast and he was speaking to two chinese people who who interact between china and the west and in china no kid can play computer games except between 8 and 9 p.m friday saturday or sunday the chinese equivalent of TikTok, they're limited to 40 minutes a day, after which it just shuts down. And after, I think, five minutes of scrolling, there's an automatic five-minute gap between the videos that's, that's programmed in so that they can't just keep right. on scrolling down. And most of the parents in China want this to happen. It's right. not that the Chinese government is imposing it, it's that the people expect the government to protect their children from themselves. And when asked... The Chinese government's biggest fear, their biggest competition is not America, it's the tech companies. Right. And which is why they have begun to instigate these problems. And the Chinese parents' biggest worry is of myopia, which is measurable in their kids. And so the Chinese government has now installed or instigated uh, a reduction plan. You know, we want the incidence of childhood myopia to be reduced by, I don't know, 10% in two years. I just made those numbers up, but our percentage within a, an amount of time. Mm. And I thought it was really interesting that in the West, we have got this tyranny of capitalism that says you have to let the social media companies make as much money as possible. You can't possibly stop them. Mm. And their route to making it is destroying our democracy and our kids, but that has to be mm. the price we pay for them to make as much money as they want. And for us to feel as if we have the freedom to be 
limbically abused all the time because we like it. And you know, what they're doing is setting up a system where they have created an addiction and then go, well, we're only giving people what they want, yeah, which is exactly. the equivalent of standing in the street corner <laughs> selling coke, cocaine, and then going, well, everybody wants to snort cocaine. You know, what's wrong with that? We're only free- feeding. You know, they want it. Why mm. would you stop? And, mm. and the government's going, oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, no worries. And I thought, you know, I'm not suggesting we all move to China, for you know, <laughs> but there is a balance to be had. And actually keeping it so that it's technically impossible for children to play games except for those hours doesn't strike me as a bad thing because it's universal. It's not like my friends are all playing games at different times. Yes, yeah, that's exactly. That's when you play games and, and, yeah. and everybody does and that's fine and after that time you don't. And we don't even know what the incidence of childhood myopia is, I don't think, no. relative to their screen time. Yeah. So I wonder, am I being rosy lensed or does that sound like something that if the government were to bring it in do you think there would just be a revolution more than there is at the moment i think that quite often parents would be quite grateful for that kind of intervention because i think one of the challenges one of the problems we have is that they're not willing to stand up for their own beliefs in the face of their children mm. there's this there's this and i'm absolutely guilty of this you know your children you have to fight hard when they throw everything at you about how you're such a mean mummy and oh but you know i just want to watch one more and you know all hell breaks loose because they want something it's very hard to stand up against that so i think a lot of parents would be very grateful if that was brought in because mm. it's like trying to stand up against the alcoholic in the family exactly. when there's a, an array of you know bottles all around and you're going no 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 you can't have it and they're just going to walk past and take it yeah. whereas if the bottles weren't there and the addiction yeah. hadn't been fed in the first place it would be a lot easier. Yeah, exactly. But again, I think I, actually I've I experienced, I've witnessed an amazing thing the other day. So whenever um, my kids do watch telly or something, we often watch things like things on YouTube and so adverts pop up and I'll stick my hand over the screen and go, oh, it's a naughty advert and make a joke about it. My daughter did that the other day. An advert came out. She put her hand over it so she couldn't see it. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So she... Okay. It's, it's, it was a learned behavior because I was yep. showing that, and, and, and you know, the fact that I called it a naughty advert probably needs explaining now because she's a bit older. But when they were younger, I made a joke about it. Yep. And so now they choose not to see the advert they because they're, huh. goodness, they're powerful for kids, you know, that kind of influence. Yes. And then the I wants yeah. follow, and then you've got yourself another battle. So I think, um, yep. you know, systemic and government led actions absolutely fundamental but so are parent support groups and and talking about it with others and sort of thinking you know convincing helping support yourself in your emotional resilience so that you can be there for your children because that's part of the challenge isn't it definitely i'm not a bad mother because i'm standing up for it yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. your groups and peer groups for the parent support and also peer groups again like you've got the cousin as an example but supposing there were I know, 30 kids in the school who were all on the same kind of regime, who were then had evidence of being decent human beings to their peers. Yeah. Then you can begin to to grow the cycle. You might get others choosing to join that group because they can see that yeah. you've got better chilled, more relaxed, happier people that, that don't need yeah. to have the stuff. Exactly. And I think, you know, that this comes full circle back to we're in, which I didn't actually go into too much at the beginning, but this is emer- we're in emergency mode. Mm. But, well, <laughs> we should be in emergency mode now. This is an emergency. People need to understand that. Parents need to understand the threat to their children. And they need to make these decisions and these actions with that knowledge and with that the strength of mm. reasoning. And then it changes a little bit. It's harder to connect through to the screen time. But for things like, you know, palm oil and biscuits in supermarkets, we just, it's an outright no, right. you know, yeah. because we cannot afford any more rainforest to be yep. t- chopped down. Yep. And I think if, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, say what you're going to say. That, that was obviously going somewhere. Well, I mean, it's it's just... I think there are a lot of things where it's much easier to just say, oh, it's okay this once, or it's just one packet of biscuits, yeah. or there's there's so much in that. And I think if you apply the climate emergency lens to a lot of what you're saying, and again, take your children with you on that, not yeah. in a scary way, but it's something I'm standing up for because I believe in it, because this is really important, because we care about our planet, and then you get back to nature connection, you know, and they they then want to help, want to join in and want to be part of it and feel good about the decision rather than it being a negative. 
But if we are in emergency mode all the time, we will burn out. Yes. And so we need somehow to find the resilience to respond resiliently rather than constantly feeling like we're fighting a rear guard action. I mm. would think just because because we will burn out and we will fall into despair and we will end up doing less than if we were able to be resilient. And I'm looking back at your My Action Matters and thinking we need to crowdfund that because it <sighs> seemed that what you were doing with that was because you could go from, OK, no more biscuits to a friend now no longer buys any of the traditional toothpaste because they too have palm oil in them. Mm -hmm. So we could we could spend a month as a collective part of the, the school, maybe finding out everything that has palm oil and and identifying the alternatives and making sure they're available in our local whole food store, say. And and then we're shopping more there rather than at the supermarket. I'm beginning to build in that sense of systemic analysis for everybody, not just the children, but the, the teachers and the parents as well, so that we can see how everything has so many repercussions and, and the second and third order effects of, yeah. okay, so I didn't buy the biscuits, they didn't need to be in ported from wherever so we saved that much on the fuel yeah. and maybe we could look at whatever companies are using fuel from anaerobic digesters on their trucks instead of fossil fuels and, and then we could begin to look at that and then we could create an anaerobic digester in the school and then we could you know there's all kinds of ways that we could do that but we just need for you, for lots of people like you to be funded. So we need to set up the My Action Matters group again, really, don't we? And yeah. uh, get a crowdfunding going for that. <laughs> that would be or amazing. Government funding <laughs> in our fantasy world of proper government. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That would be amazing. So we're heading down time-wise. In terms of I'm looking at your amazing mind map, <laughs> we talked a bit about mental health. I think Probably eco-anxiety and not gaslighting is is really crucial. We've talked about growing your own stuff. We've talked about education. We've talked a little bit about connecting with nature. Let's talk a little bit more about that and then see what else is, okay. is big for you. How do you find your kids respond to what I would call reconnecting with the web of life? Um, they... My kids are fairly well integrated with nature. What we what we broadly term nature, you know, going out and, and understanding, loving trees and looking at flowers and playing in the dirt and that kind of stuff. Um, my my six year old will, ha in fact, when he was five, he cried when the farmers scalped the hedges and said can we can we write to him please can we write to the farmer and I was like well, yeah <laughs> thinking yeah we can won't make any difference um but I said to him yes of course we can and you know so he took a little bit of action there and he can't really write so I wrote did the writing um and then didn't really send it anywhere because the guy that doesn't live nearby here but so again I, the, the lockdown period was amazing because they would take time to just lie in the grass and look really closely at the little beetle crawling on their hand and yeah they, they respond really well to it they they understand the importance and their place I think I talk a lot about if we do this what are the consequences down the food chain um right. and so they understand you know I can get I got to the point where I can sort of say we need to do this to help tackle climate change or we need to do this to help the planet, planet earth and they will choose to do that whatever that action was and um but i think fundamentally we need more and more children to respect nature to give it space to know their place within the ecosystem mm. to, to know that we are nature there's that brilliant mm. i heard that brilliant traffic jam analogy the other day someone on social media sort of saying oh i'm stuck in another traffic jam and so, someone else said you are the traffic jam <laughs> if you're yes, in it you're part right. of it yes and it's yes. the othering of what's going on yes. so yes it's not my traffic jam i just happen to be i'm, I'm stuck in other people's cars yeah yeah and it's not going to happen for every child you know n nature connectedness um i worked on a big project in swansea once and and the survey sort of said that 50 percent of children who lived in the bay there had never been to the sea they're in they're on this most beautiful beach and they'd never been wow. so wow. you know and they're not going to have a high <laughs> connection they with nature. Taken. you know it seems to me every little child is born as a you know we are paleolithic at birth yeah and, and that's in there i think like fires at multi-stories you can't go to the sea and not be touched by it no and they just it needs opportunity doesn't it and and being given the space and the time to go and 
and run there. Yes. And I think crucially, I think that sense of being part of, not seeing it, not othering. Yes. We have to somehow foster that. I don't know how we do it, though, in kids who've never seen the sea. Exactly. And I think that's where parents and businesses and schools and, you know, all various programs springing up can help support that and offer opportunities. So that's a lovely example of something we're doing with Beaver Trust is trying to get children down to beaver wetlands where they'll experience the hope and joy that is a beaver wetland, um, yes. particularly if they're feeling climate anxiety. And, you know, that's an amazing antidote. But but you they, you don't need much. You just need a, a, a one off or, a, you know, basic experience of nature and it can completely ignite a love of it and an understanding of it and you can get that through a walk in a city as well as a walk in the countryside you know there's just as much to see on a pavement actually in most cities as long as they're not heavily sprayed yeah and you can get it just watching your social media your little the videos that the beaver trust makes of so those infrared cameras i particularly like the one of the kind of father and son beaver building the dam together <laughs> yeah and they're only a couple of minutes long but they're it's there and yeah. you know this there were no beavers before and now there are and it's it feels miraculous and looks glorious and and is really moving so mm. yeah the more you can feed out of those the better i'm also staring i've i've just called it up the restoring shropshire verges project rsvp should you happen to want your your 5 year old to do something yeah, there are there are projects around the country and and here they went to the council and said okay tell us who cuts the verges and it turns out the council is taking our council tax or whatever and paying contractors on the other side of the country because they happen to have offered slightly cheaper, who then come back and get people from out of county to come and cut our verges. Oh, God. So, so one, the verges don't need to be cut. Two, we, we just had a chain four people long mm. that doesn't involve anyone who's actually here. And that's insane. We that's don't need insane. to be Marxist and Preston model to know that, that that's not a useful way to do things. But by actually writing to the council by getting together a group of people who cared enough to show the councillors that actually this is something that people are noticing, getting things in the parish newspapers and getting people to to write in and go, that verge was just cut and it's July and that's you know that's mm -hmm. actually illegal. Then they've managed really to change things. So again, one one really dedicated person has basically made this happen. So if your five-year-old gets really keen. He already wants to work for Beaver Trust, so that's okay. Alrighty. I think we're probably heading out of time what is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you feel is going to go into this book that we are busy planning that will really help parents and grandparents or teachers to engage and make a difference? Or is there a final chapter that's going to round everything up? There's probably a summary chapter that looks again about uh, it looks again about inviting people in and to create a community around it. The all We Can Save anthology mm. is a really good example of where my head's at with all this. You know, they, particularly in the mother's section, you know, they looked at, you, you need some sort of trigger to make you see how important this is, that we don't sit in denial and do nothing about it. And for me, that for parents, that's their children. Mm. And then it's, it will matter that you do this. It does matter that you you know, that you um, speak to your friends about it, that you decide to only fly once next year. Or not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, um, but, um, but I think, you know, realistically, some of the parents that I see fly many times a year and even getting them, yeah, getting them to cut down to once for right. one good reason, you know, or uh, better reason, is, is going to be better than sort of saying you mustn't fly because you're I right. think that turns yes, people off. Yes, psychologically, you're right. Maybe maybe there's a final chapter on authenticity. And I think that at their hearts, a lot of parents believe that this is real and they'd like to be doing more. And I want to encourage them to stand up for that. Brilliant. And have the strength and power to, to, to trust that it's important and that they'll be heard and that it matters. Yeah. And my last thing that I've still got on my notes is I don't know to what extent there are young adult and children's books that are what Rupert would call throughtopian, that aren't dystopias or utopias, but that are, here's where we need to get here, and here's how we did it, and here's the mm. heroic actions that we took in doing so. Do they exist, or is that something that when we do the Throughtopia Masterclass, we maybe need to get some children authors in and really focus on that? Um, I would say they definitely need to, that okay. needs to happen. Yeah, from from what I've seen, 
Um, and forgive me, authors, if I've missed a really important book somewhere. Well, they'll tell us if anybody knows of books that actually are doing this. Because I remember reading The Carbon Diaries about 10 years ago, which was really clever and beautifully written. But it was a, here's how we're responding to the government having instigated carbon rationing. Not, here's a future that we all want to get to. That you know, Here's why it's so much better not to have to apply, because look, we did mm. this. And it was wonderful. And look, this is what it feels like to live in a resilient, emotionally literate, politically joined up culture. And and yes, it's not easy. And yes, there's still going to be difficulty and the hero's journey to be taken. But but feel this, it feels different. And I, I haven't found that yet. You know, in, in adult terms, the Ministry for the Future is the closest we get, but it's still completely predicated mm-hmm. in the current system. And I think we need we need visions of systemic change and how it looks and how it feels. So if you come across anybody, if anybody out there knows any, please let us know. Eva Bishop, thank you so much for this book that hopefully you will write and bring out. And all of the amazing things that you're doing. I really want to honour the way that you're living and the, the stories that you are telling and the things that you're doing because it has to be making a difference. And if everybody did what you were doing, the world would already be a different place. That's very kind. Thank you. So so thank you, hugely. Thank you, Manda. And that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Eva for everything that she's doing. I said at the end, but I want to say it again. I am genuinely in awe of her capacity to see things systemically and then to apply it in her life. If we all did everything that she's doing, the world would be a different place. And as she says, what matters is that we find the actions that work for us and then share them. And we need the stories. We are definitely heading down towards the Thrutopia Masterclass and at the end of a podcast soon, probably next week, I will tell you in detail more about it. But it does seem to me that if we don't offer people the visions of how the future could feel and work, that they want to get to, and the route map to get there, then we're not going to make it. And that a lot of the problem that we have now is because we haven't got those visions. So, coming soon, a better explanation of that. In the meantime, we will be back next week with another conversation. And in the meantime, enormous thanks to Caro C for stellar sound production and the music at the head and foot, to Faith Tillery for the website, and all of the conversations that make this happen, to Anne Thomas for the transcripts, and to you for listening. If you know of anybody else who gets this and who wants to be part of the generative dance of the world, please do send them this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you, and goodbye.